Hello everyone, today is October 14th, 2020, and today is National Fossil Day. And today I wanted to showcase a couple of fossils for National Fossil Day, and those are trilobite fossils. Trilobites are very abundant in the fossil record. They occur in many numbers. Um, trilobites first appeared in the Cambrian period about 541 to 521 million years ago, and the last trilobites died out about 245 million years ago. And so today I have a couple of trilobites here to show you, and these are really, really fantastic specimens. I believe are fantastic specimens that are part of my personal collection. And trilobites are actually arthropods. They are animals that are related to things like horseshoe crabs, spiders, lobsters, and things of that nature. Um, they have jointed appendages, and they can occur in lots and lots of numbers. Um, trilobites are extinct. Um, they are sadly, they are no longer exist today. Um, the closest thing or the closest relatives to trilobites are things like horseshoe crabs and things of that nature. Um, but there are nothing like trilobites living today. Um, if you want to compare a trilobite living today, or you want to compare a animal that looks very similar to the trilobite, honestly, I would probably say isopods, um, or things like roly-polies. These are also crustaceans. These are land crustaceans, and also the larger isopods live in the ocean. But they are nothing related to trilobites. They are arthropods, but they're distantly closely related to trilobites. But trilobites are nothing like they were in the past. Um, they're extinct. They're gone. Uh, we won't have any trilobites living today, sadly, but we do have an incredible fossil record of these animals because trilobites, uh, uh, are, their skeletons are composed of calcium carbonate. And this is also when we start to see, in the Cambrian period, we also start to see um, biomineralization. So this occurs when animals start to build their uh, exoskeletons out of hard parts, and they use that hard part, they use that mineral to strengthen their shell, and they become really, really great fossils. So trilobites are actually very common fossils because their shells are composed of calcium carbonate, and they use that calcium carbonate to enable to strengthen their shell and create great fossils. So trilobite actually means three lobe, and actually for this trilobite, this is a great example, um, it's divided into this way, so it's divided into the axis lobe, and then these lobes here, but they're also divided into another three different ways, so they're divided into the cephalon, the thorax, and then the bottom part, which is the pygidium. Um, this specimen comes from Morocco, of the Anti-Atlas Mountains of Morocco, and it comes from the Devonian rocks um, from that location. So trilobites uh, can also occur, and they can also um, roll up into a tight little ball. Now, we don't see enrolling. This is what we, this is what it's known as enrolling. We don't see enrolling until we get actually get into the Ordovician and more as we get closer into the Devonian and then uh, so on and so forth right at the end of the Permian period, right at the end of the Paleozoic. And so when we talk about enrolling, we're actually talking about when trilobites actually protect themselves. So they're able to tuck their pygidium underneath their cephalon to protect their little legs and to protect the soft parts of their of the animal. So this is a Devonian trilobite, and this one is partially enrolled, and you can actually see it is, it's tucked its pygidium underneath its cephalon during death so it can protect themselves. Now, trilobites not always, don't, do not always get to protect themselves like this. Um, some of them can enroll, but also have like these giant spikes as defense mechanisms. So sometimes enrolling wasn't always, uh, wasn't always good. They needed, uh, large spikes and spines to protect themselves um, against predators like fish and like large cephalopods that occurred during that time. Here is another trilobite. Um, this one is also enrolled as well where its pygidium is tucked underneath its cephalon. And when I mean pygidium, I mean the tail and the cephalon, I mean the head. So the camp largest trilobites can occur in the Cambrian and also the Ordovician. Uh, some of these can get about the size of a dinner plate. This book here actually represents a very large trilobite from the Cambrian period. This is Paradoxides, and this occurs in the Middle Cambrian rocks of Newfoundland. And they can get quite quite large. This is actually the actual size of how large these trilobites can grow. So that's my hand here, and that's the picture of the Paradoxides from Newfoundland. And they can get quite large. Um, some of the largest trilobites occurred in the Cambrian, but also some other large trilobites like Isotelis that is found in Ohio and that is found in British Columbia can also be found um, as large as these specimens about the size of a dinner plate. Uh, the first trilobites appeared in the Cambrian period, so this is a specimen from the Pioche Shale, which is about 521 million years ago, and these are some of the oldest known trilobites. Um, 
These are known as Retlichiids, and the Retlichiids are the first uh, groups of trilobites to occur in the fossil record. So, they were very interesting. They were very different from the trilobites that you typically think and know of, like this particular guy right here. This is Dalmanides. This comes from the upper Silurian rocks of um, New York State. So that is a very, uh, really interesting trilobite. You can see it's broken down just like all trilobites into three different parts. You got the tail, the pygidium, the cephalon, or the, I'm sorry, the thorax, and then the cephalon, which is right here. But it's also divided into this way. So this is a, a really a classic example of what a well-preserved trilobite looks like. Um, trilobites um, also had mouth parts. Um, trilobites typically fed on the detr detritus matter, so they fed on um, they fed on like soft-bodied organisms. They also fed on like mud from the seafloor to get nutrients. So this is a mouth plate um, from a trilobite, um, actually from Isotelis. Um, this specimen is from the Ordovician rocks of, I believe, Missouri. And this is a really interesting specimen. This is a mouth plate or the hypostone um, that is actually underneath the um, the uh, the globella or the um, the stomach of these trilobites. Um, here's another great example of a trilobite. Here, this is Arathia and I'm sorry, Arathia kingi. This is the most common trilobite in North America, if not the world. There are people that mine these. There are there are Native Americans that have used these for jewelry. Um, Arathia is a very common trilobite that you'll typically see in rock and mineral shows, and this specimen occurs in the famous Middle Cambrian Wheeler Formation of uh, Utah. So, a very, very um, famous trilobite that you'll typically see, and uh, it's a very classic example of what a trilobite looks like. You'll typically see them in rock and mineral shows, and, and, and um, you'll typically see them in like rock shops and gift shops and things like that. Um, trilobites had also really interesting looking eyes. Um, uh, there are two different types of eyes that trilobites had, the Shih coral and the Holocoral eyes. Um, the Dalmanides, or I'm sorry, the Fikapa trilobites are the ones that took these to extreme. Um, they, this, uh, this specimen actually has a really good example of its eyes. Um, each lens would have been made out of calcite. And calcite, just like the hard parts of the skeleton, are created out of. And trilobites would have actually been able to see quite well. Um, they ha almost had like a three, I believe, like 360 vision, maybe? Um, I could be wrong on that, but um, they could have seen very well. Um, they would have been able to see predators around them so they can... Uh, so they can focus on what they're looking at and what to feed. Um, they only had the direct vision, so they could probably only see forward. Um, they probably couldn't see completely 360 or completely all around, but they were probably able to just look forward and see forward um, to try to figure out what was around them. And they also had little antennae um, as uh, sensors, and they would have had little legs. Um, there are some specimens that occur um, in China and I believe in New York. Um, that actually preserve um, soft-bodied um, remains. So the little legs that you see underneath the carapace of these trilobites um, are preserved uh, in pyrite. So some of these specimens can preserve very well, including their soft body parts. Uh, trilobites are, are one of my favorite, personal favorite fossils because it's the first fossil that I ever found when I was a kid. I found my first fossil um, behind a teaching trailer and I identified it as a trilobite. Um, and they became my first love. I love trilobites. They are very, very abundant in the fossil record. We know so much about them. New trilobites are also being named, um, actually, and so it's really cool to see these specimens, and it, it's really cool to know that these animals um, were very dominant. They were very successful in the fossil record. Um, they were as long. They lived as long as dinosaurs. They lived as long as humans and mammals and birds. Um, so these are animals that existed longer than anything else uh, that we get. We can think of. Maybe bacteria, you know, existed longer. But as animals, trilobites were the kings of success during the Paleozoic and then they died about 245 million years ago and we don't have anything else but their fossils. So uh, I just wanted to really talk about trilobites today. I hope this video is informative and I will see you later on a next video.